Welcome back to the next session of Lean AppSec. My name is uh, Henrik Plater. I'm a security researcher at Endo Labs, and I'm very glad and honored to have Nero with me. Nero. Hi, Henrik. Thank you for having me on this. Uh, it's really my pleasure to partner with you as well in this uh, super interesting discussion. Um, as uh, Henrik mentioned, uh, I'm from GitHub, uh, and I'm responsible for the advanced security business here at GitHub. Uh, and uh, we really see AI uh, and the uh, LLM work that's going on as being uh, an integral part of our strategy in the future. So it's really exciting to talk through this today with you. Thanks. Yeah, so glad to have you. So uh, Nero and I will walk you through the main findings of this year's uh, dependency management uh, report that we have compiled over the course of the last months. And uh, both the report and the presentation are basically split into two main topics. We will start with some insights and findings related to artificial intelligence and in particular, the use of large language models. So here we have two interesting use cases, one from Endo Labs and one from GitHub, as well as some insight into the security of the top 100 open source AI projects. And then we will transition to a second part, which is all about kind of the magic and the benefits of core graph analysis and what it can bring to organizations in terms of better risk management, the reduction of wasted effort, and overall more visibility in how open source components are used throughout the development process. All right, so let's dive into it. And we will start with a rather easy chart um, that is again reflecting how much the release of ChatGPT and in particular the release of its programming API sparked innovation among the open source uh, community. So what we did here is we anyhow scan all the open source packages uploaded to PyPI and NPM. And shortly after the API was released in January 20th, we also started tracking the use of this API just to get a feeling for how many open source packages published on those platforms would benefit and experiment with those large language models from OpenAI in particular. And so what you see on the right hand side is basically the numbers we, we have observed. We kind of expected, of course, that many packages will adopt it and use it, but we were still surprised by the extent, uh, by the explosion, if you will, of the number of packages being published there. So since the release of the API in January, by now there are more than 900 open source packages published on those platforms that make use of LLMs, of OpenAI, for various use cases. And 600 of those, more than 600 of those packages, 70% have been created only after that release. And that is explaining this steep uh, increase and the steep curve to the on the right-hand side of the graph. And another almost 300 packages that already existed before added um, support for OpenAI through its API. And so this of course is only the kind of the tip of the development, right? It only shows those packages that made it to NPM and PyPI. Of course, there are numerous additional proprietary and private efforts to use LLMs for all kinds of purposes and use cases. And we find it's a very nice indicator again of, of the whole of a whole new wave of LLM powered applications that will be coming at us if you want. Um, of course, many of those packages may disappear, right? It's all part of some you know, early experiments to discover which use cases work well, which use cases do not work so well. And one that we found particularly interesting at Endo Labs is using the power of large language models in the review of potentially malicious code snippets or potentially malicious packages. We anyways monitor PyPI and NPM on a continuous basis in order to detect and then remove um, malicious packages uploaded to those platforms. And you certainly know there was a spike and a, let's say, steady increase of such malicious, malicious packages over the course of the last, let's say, three, four years or so. And so 
we were very, let's say, positively surprised and enthusiastic following early experiments using the UI. So what you see here is a code snippet from a malicious NPM package called API Amazon 100. It is the typical behavior of a dropper, meaning this malicious code snippet basically downloads second stage payload, in this case, a Windows executable to the computer of the infected developer, and then is starting this malicious payload locally. And so when asking three different large language models about the maliciousness of those code snippet, we happily saw that they kind of agreed on this being suspicious, malicious behavior, right? So we were asking three, uh, two models of OpenAI, GPT 3.5, as well as GPT 4, as well as one model uh, from Google Vertex AI called Text Bison. And they kind of all agreed on, on a scale from zero to nine, that this is um, very suspicious and likely malicious. And so starting from there, we integrated um, this LLM-based reviews into our regular scan pipeline that is monitoring those package repositories. And the approach we follow is basically we scan every file of every package uploaded to those platforms and search first for suspicious syntactical patterns or data flow patterns that are yeah, typical for malware behavior. One example would be the dropper behavior you have seen on the previous slide. Another example is the exfiltration of environment variables, which often contain secrets such as API tokens. And once we come across such matches, we basically present the respective code snippets to two different models, GPT 3.5 and Text Bison, and again ask them to rate the maliciousness on this scale from zero to nine. We initially wanted to also include GPT-4 in this study, but uh, due to the long response times, um, we decided against it. For the snippet you have seen on the previous slide, GPT-4 required three times as much time to respond with the assessment compared to the other models. And, and this shows that it doesn't scale very well to a scanning pipeline that scans thousands and thousands of packages published on PyPI and NPM on a daily basis. The good news of this study was that those models, GPT 3.5 and Vertex AI or Text Bison, uh, they, they mostly agree. What you see here in this chart is basically the difference in the risk score provided by those two models for more than 3,000 snippets that we presented to them. So for example, the leftmost bar in this bar chart says that in 1,429 cases, GPT 3.5 and Text Bison came up with the exact same risk rating. In 1,587 cases, the risk rating provided by the models only differed by one point. And so if we consider those two differences of zero and one as basically agreement, we can say that both models agree in, agree in kind of 89% of the cases. On the very right-hand side, you see those cases where they disagree heavily. So in this case, um, for example, on the, the rightmost bar, we have 16 cases where one of them said this is not malicious, gave it a risk score of zero, while the other gave it a risk score of nine. So while they mostly agree, the problem is though that they also agree if both are wrong. And so in the next step, we basically looked in more detail at the specific assessments. And um, well, this is an example uh, where basically they disagreed. And I was expecting another slide, in fact, but we can go through this example now. Um, so this is a case where they disagreed heavily, or more significantly, let's say. Uh, this is a package.json file that was part of the malicious NPM package delivery promise. Again, it's a 
typical example for JavaScript malware pub published there. Uh, and what it does, it, it basically takes advantage of a so-called pre-installation hook, um, which is a way to basically automatically execute uh, code upon the installation of an NPM package on some computer system. And what the pre-installation hook does in this case, it is basically exfiltration, uh, exfiltrating the host name taken from the environment variable and uploading it to some attacker controlled server. So this information is not highly critical, but it is generally considered very bad practice and at least bad practice. And, and so this package has been yanked. They, both of the models came to, to different conclusions. GPT 3.5 rated it only with a two on the scale from zero to nine, basically saying this is benign, while text bison understood better that this is a typical malicious behavior as seen in many other cases. So here, the conclusion probably is that um, GPT 3.5 didn't understand, in quotes, the behavior implemented with this pre-installation hook. And so now back to the slide that I was expecting, uh, actually before, uh, we went uh, and reviewed all the cases in more detail where either both of the models came up with a risk rating of more than five, uh, more than four, as well as those cases you have seen on the previous uh, two, two slides ago, where the rating difference is bigger than four, so where they disagree. And the, the results were a little, little bit sobering, which is uh, visible when looking at those confusion matrices. The first matrix is for uh, GPT 3.5. Those confusion matrices are a typical instrument to understand uh, the quality or performance of classification models. And what it shows is basically all the correct and wrong assessments. So correct assessments would be true positives and true negatives. The wrong assessments would be false positives and false negatives. So false positive, for example, is a case where the assessment says something is, the model said something is malicious while in fact it was benign. And false positive are exactly the problem where uh, GPT 3.5, uh, let's say, suffers from. It has a very high number of false positives. So in many cases, it said it is malicious even though it was legitimate, which makes that the overall precision of its assessments is pretty low, below 5%. And text bison is not so different. It also has a relatively low precision of just under 8%, which means that um, a human uh, reviewing those assessments will need to you know, shovel through a lot of false findings, which is a lot of, let's say, effort in vain. And the reasons we found for all those false positives are as follows. The main reason is hacked and minified JavaScript, which is a technique to reduce the size of JavaScript files that are downloaded to your browser. And this technique consists of removing uh, line breaks and other unnecessary white spaces. It also consists of renaming identifiers, shortening identifiers to single characters, for example, which makes that overall, the result of that packaging and minification is that it is hardly readable for any human. So, and what happened is that those models both uh, considered such code as obfuscated. And because obfuscation is also often used by malicious packages, all those files were considered as malicious, even though the vast majority was actually in, in, benign. Another reason were kind of hallucinations about incomplete snippets. So because of the token limitation, um, the number of yeah, tokens that you can include in your prompt submitted to the model, um, we could only we could not include full files. 
So the complete files in many cases, but just a subset, a snippet, basically a fraction. And then sometimes the models started, you know, imagining that there is malicious behavior in the parts that they don't see and as such rated the whole package or the whole thing as malicious. And a third reason is that a lot of or some functionalities are kind of have a dual use nature. So they can be used for malicious purposes as well as for benign and legitimate purposes. So for example, um, this dropper behavior, which downloading executables to a system and running it, there are also legitimate cases where you use such behavior, right? Another example would be uh, kind of uh, whitehead hacking tools that you find in PyPI or NPM, which contain functionalities such as reverse shells or so, which are again used by whitehead hackers as well as blackhead hackers, hackers for malicious purposes. Um, two other findings real quick. A lot has been talked about prompt injection, which is basically resulting from the fact that um, we mix or we include user provided input into the instructions coming from the developer, from the application. In our particular case, prompt injection is even more relevant so because we exp explicitly search for stuff coming from malicious actors. And so of course they uh, search for ways to make their code look benign and they can do so by adding comments such as, you know, the following download and execution does something very useful and benign and important, so don't worry about it. And in order to prevent such prompt injection vulnerabilities, we decided on our end to basically remove all comments and rename all identifiers in order to reduce, let's say, the expo exposure to those sort of vulnerabilities. And that is possible, which is a good news, because of course, whatever the attackers upload and hide in those malicious packages still needs to be interpretable or compilable depending on the programming language. And so um, it is, let's say, always possible to kind of create, if you want some other representation such as a syntax tree and remove those things that give rise to prompt injection vulnerabilities. The second more concerning finding is um, that large language models are also a great support to attackers. So we, we ran a couple of experiments where we basically um, let them play against each other. We were asking LLMs on the one side to hide malicious code and make it look benign. And we did so in several iterations. And it turned out that the LLMs were very supportive in modifying this malicious code such that this risk rating we were talking before went steadily down below the threshold of what is considered malicious and what is considered benign. So they yeah, are, are also unfortunately a very useful tool uh, for, for the attackers. Overall, our findings and our conclusions are that there are there is a high false positive rate, particularly due to this obfuscated minified packed JavaScript code. But there are also false negatives, uh, especially when it comes to more complex, um, let's say, programming logic, especially when attacker code is spread across different uh, procedures. So for interprocedural data flows, or even more so when malicious code is split across different files or even different packages, which we have also observed and reported to PyPI just the other week. So those complex foes, as well as the adversarial context, make us think that this is a use case for LLMs that um, they will not be, at least in the, in the near future, be able to automatically solve, right? So there are a great assistance. They can provide additional information. They can summary, uh, summarize information, but they will not be able to replace any you know, human reviewers in this whole malware scanning pipeline process.
That's a very interesting uh, insight there, Henrik. Um, you know, here at GitHub, we talk about AI as a co-pilot and not as an autopilot, right? For that very reason that, you know, we strongly believe that, you know, the next phase of uh, rolling out these models will be strongly paired uh, with humans, uh, where humans are making the decisions as part of that process. Um, and it's actually very interesting as you talk about like scenarios like prompt injection, you know, just as a very interesting divergent but parallel kind of problem when you look at even autonomous driving today, there are certain graphics that you can present to the cameras of autonomous driving systems that can make a truck look like a bicycle. Uh, and it's really, this is just a very similar problem, just in a different context. Uh, and it probably also goes a long way towards maybe the AI is a little bit too trusting of humans. Trust me, I'm not doing anything bad. Uh, but really, you know, <clears throat> the way that as humans, we understand that there are problems is we look at the full context of what's going on, right? And when we look at AI today, you know, one of the big challenges is that, you know, a typical application is, you know, is half a million to a million lines of code. There just aren't enough tokens in our prompts available today that we can cost effectively present something that big to a model and say, assess what's going on. So we have to, as you said, take blocks or snippets of information and share that with uh, with the with the models and ask them if they can make assessments on that. And obviously, when you lose context, things can appear true that are not true and things can appear false uh, that are actually uh, true as well. So I think, um, you know, that's one of the big things that we've learned uh, is really about how to, you know, um, where are the models successful? Like in localized problems, they're great, but in kind of deep interprocedural data flow problems like you speak about here, generally there's some challenges because we have to compromise in the context for cost and for compute efficiency and compute cost and compute time and, and so on. So uh, that's a very interesting conclusion you've drawn. And I would say very similar to what we've seen as well as we've uh, scaled this technology. Mm -hmm. Now, just to, to add on this, I mean, what, what is very, I think, common to many of the safety and security use cases of AI is this adversarial context, right? So you have really an attacker who is patiently and steadily searching for the loopholes to evade the detection. And that is something that is, I believe, difficult for um, those models to handle. Absolutely. And, and actually, as we jump to the next slide, we start to see a context of actually how complicated that problem is if you're uh, you know, a, a, a solo developer or a large enterprise. You know, our data here at GitHub tells us that, you know, in a typical application today, over 90% of the software that's used inside that application is open source. Um, and, you know, if you could just click again, you know, the the valuable thing that we see here at GitHub, though, is that actually the vast majority of that open source software sits or lives on GitHub today as, as open source projects. And so for us, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, what is how complex is this problem and what can we do to help organizations and enterprises and developers really understand what the impact is? when something goes awry or, or wrong with one of these dependencies that we bring in. And again, just to kind of dig a little bit deeper into how prevalent open source software is and the complexity, we can take a look at something like TensorFlow. You know, machine learning is so hot right now. TensorFlow is one of the more popular libraries that we have on GitHub. Uh, and what you can see here is that while the you know original TensorFlow project only has a couple of thousand developers, if we just click through this again, you can see that by the time we look at all of the um, transitive dependencies of TensorFlow and the number of developers that are associated with all of those transitive dependencies, there are over 23,000 independent developers contributing towards making TensorFlow what it is today that either you or I, or those of you watching at home or in the office are able to leverage. And 23,000 contributors, if you think about like a large enterprise organization today, they're probably talking about fifty to sixty thousand developers, maybe a hundred thousand for our largest. We're talking about you know something that represents twenty five percent of our largest enterprises and probably a lot bigger than a typical enterprise um, would have. So when you think about that complexity and the number of places that things can go wrong, and to your point, Henrik, where people have like malicious intent, there's a lot of places that we can hide uh, bad things. 
Uh, and so really understanding what it takes to build an application, what it takes to bring an open source package and understanding what is really important from that can help us prioritize how we respond when we discover an issue. So um, I'll pass it back to you, Hendrik, for the next bit. Yeah, I think it is an understatement to say, understatement to say that TensorFlow is among the more well-known and more used. It is, in fact, uh, it came up on the top of the top 100 AI, AI repositories on GitHub that we looked at in more detail. And uh, we did so in order to better understand basically the complexity of those um, AI repositories, AI projects. So in terms of complexity, in terms of how many dependencies do they have? And um, are those dependencies subject to any known vulnerabilities? And so we created this top 100 list uh, on the basis of the stars, uh, the number of stargazers. And um, TensorFlow is really on the, on the very top of the list, followed closely by AutoGPT, which is a project that has been just created like three months or four months ago. Um, so it's interesting to see how quickly it was able to, uh, you know, uh, caught up um, uh, in, 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 in kind of popularity. Uh, AutoGPT being basically uh, a first step towards an agent-based uh, autonomous agent uh, using LLMs for breaking down lower uh, high-level tasks and into low-level tasks and being connected to tools that can execute on those fan granular um, activities, let's say. So um, question is how much complexity bring you do you bring in when using any of those um, AI repositories? And so what we did in order to approach this is we scanned the default branches um, of all those projects, uh, meaning for in, to search for manifest files. Manifest files such as a pom.xml or a requirements.txt file in Python are used by developers to declare dependencies. So we were searching for those so-called direct dependencies, and then we resolved all the transitive dependencies, meaning the dependencies of the dependencies and so forth. And in the next step, we mapped vulnerabilities to those components on the level and granularity of the entire component. Maybe another important thing to mention is that those repositories are of a very different nature. So you have both developer frameworks, you have full fledged applications, but you also have more, you know, Jupyter notebooks that people used in order to tweak and uh, work and polish data sets or so. And uh, also important to mention, those manifest files represent different, let's say, artifacts or programs. Some of those programs and artifacts end up, again, on package repositories like PyPI. So this is what you can use when as a dependency yourself. Other manifest files are used for sample applications or test applications, but this doesn't make them less relevant because Many times such test applications or demo applications are also kind of the blueprint and the starting point for you know, projects building on the respective technology. And so they would also start from, from vulnerable, potentially vulnerable dependencies. And uh, so in, in terms of uh, complexity, in terms of the number of dependency, what we found is that um, they basically use a lot of dependencies. Um, and so here, uh, basically, 67% um, um, of the, no, 77, in fact, of the uh, projects use more than 50 uh, dependencies, up to um, yeah, let's, more than 500. I think the outliers were around 2,000, 2,500 different dependencies. Overall, there are 11% that have more than 500 dependencies. In average, there are 208, both direct and transitive. Um, and in the next step, we mapped the dependencies to known vulnerabilities, known from our own vulnerability database. 
And we found that basically 52% of those repositories, so the majority, has one or more vulnerabilities. And 15% have even more than 10 or so, 10 vulnerabilities. And so the obvious next question is, if you depend on only any of those repositories or any of the artifacts that are produced in those projects, do those vulnerabilities matter for you? Am I impacted? Am I affected? Do I need to care? Or can I you know, um, reduce the priority? Can I skip looking into those? And this is what the next section of our presentation will be all about. We will show you how call graph analysis can be used to, let's say, reduce the effort required to answer such questions. And not only this, but also supports how it supports other use cases. To explain this better, we start again from a chart, from a picture that I also that I already showed and explained in the last edition of the State of Dependency Management Report last year in November or so. It shows a dependency graph of a Maven plugin. So this Maven plugin is the application, right? The client project. You see this is the, the grayish box on the top of the graph. The developers of this application declared eight direct dependencies. And those direct dependencies bring in, again, other transitive, so-called transitive dependencies, right? In total, there are 42 dependencies and the depth of the graph is seven. Um, and then the problem that happens on a regular basis for developers is there are new vulnerabilities being disclosed in any of those dependencies. There is a new CVE brought to the attention and the first, let's say, generation of software composition analysis tools basically brought, just bring up those findings. You have a transitive dependency. There is a vulnerability in it. Please care for it. Assess whether it is affecting you or not. And if it is, please solve it. But this is a very hard task for the developers because if that vulnerability is affecting a dependency deep down in this graph, maybe it is affecting a dependency that he never has heard about. He doesn't know what it is used for, what it, what it can do, what is its functionality, and especially what is the functionality used in the context of his particular dependency graph, right? So how can he, how can he know? Um, and the answer is that we need to open those boxes. We do not need to look at dependencies just, you know, at, at this cause granularity where, you know, you have a box which has a name and a version, but we basically need to look into the functions, the bits and pieces that make up this component. And this is when we um, basically enter the realm of call graphs. And what you see here on the left-hand side, it's, not only a nice picture, but it is showing uh, basically a call graph, one of the call graphs that we have built for a well-known logging library in Java, which is called Logback Access in version 146. And uh, this graph is consisting of more than 14,000 nodes. Each node is representing a function, so a small piece of executable code. And it is comprised, the graph is comprised of more than 60,000 edges, which are invocations. So one function calling another function. The functions or nodes that belong to the client application, logback access, are colored in green, a little bit bigger in size. And the color of all the other nodes is depending and chosen uh, depending on which package they come from. So for example, all the dark red nodes and edges on the upper left corner of the call graph belong to a component called Tomcat Coyote. The beauty of those call graphs um, is the variety of use cases they support. All those use cases bring, let's say, immediate benefit to organizations. Um, what we will go through in the next few slides is we will use those to better understand how much code is imported versus actually used. You remember the number that Nero mentioned earlier on. An average application 
comprises 90% of open source code. So the question is how much of all that code is in fact used? And the second topic we will look at is uh, that of reachability. And so the question whether vulnerable methods in any of those dependencies, no matter how deep down there are in the graph, whether those methods can be reached because reachability of vulnerable methods is of course a prerequisite for the vulnerabilities being exploitable. If you cannot reach it, attackers will have a hard time exploiting it in most of the cases. There are other use cases that we will need to uh, touch upon in another presentation. That's an excellent graph, Henrik, that you had there. And I think it's it just shows the amount of complexity there is. And, and to your point, how much of this here is actually really relevant for the use case that this logback access is actually trying to achieve and how much of this is just, you know, the external baggage that's coming along for the ride. ride. It's the residual risk that's sitting in our application uh, that is potentially exposing and increasing our threat surface. So it's a, a super interesting visualization of, of, of the complexity of the problem. Thank you for sharing this. Yeah. Just a small clarification. All of the nodes that you see here those are nodes that can be reached. So this is already a simplification because functions that cannot be invoked are not even part of that graph, right? And so this is <clears throat> uh, how in the next step we computed again the, the, the question or the answers to the question, how much code do we import? How much code do we actually use of what is imported? Uh, and so uh, the basis, the data set, that we started from is the census two data set compiled by the Linux Foundation and Harvard, which is um, comprising the most used open source components in production applications. So this is a very relevant data set that we also already looked at in the last edition of our report. And so the first question is, again, how much code of a typical application comes from open source components? What we do so is basically we look at the lines of code of all the open source components versus the code of the client application. And the chart shows and confirms what Nero was mentioning earlier on. Here you see um, basically the distribution of components, census two components as to how much external code they use. On the very right hand side, you see that 1,380 of those components use between 90 or are comprised of between 90 and 100% of external code. On the very left-hand side of the bar chart, you see that 396 of those components um, are comprised only of between zero and 10% of external code. And so, this is confirming the numbers um, we have seen a couple of slides ago. The average is 71%. So 71% of the code base of the analyzed census two components comes from imported open source components, open source dependencies. And the next obvious questions, and here we come back to the call graph, is how much of all that is in fact relevant? How much is really used? And here um, we basically that is a straightforward task, as I was mentioning. All the functions or the nodes we have seen in the core graph are the ones that can be reached. And so here we just need to basically associate the lines of code to the reachable functions. We did so distinguishing between direct dependencies and transitive dependencies. On the left-hand side, you see the number of components that use a certain percentage of their direct dependencies. So for example, the leftmost bar says that 366 applications only use between zero and 5% of the open source code that they imported. So a very small fraction. And that fraction gets even smaller if you look at transitive dependencies. The right um, violet bar um, says that there are, for example, 604 applications that only use between zero and five percent of the imported code, which means that uh, in general, the trend is the more closer, let's say, if you look, you use more of your direct dependencies than you use of your transitive dependencies. The deeper you go down into your dependency graph, 
you likely use less and less code of the respective dependency. An average, <clears throat> and this is a number to, to retain, the average use of imported code is between 12 and 38%. This range is resulting from how you treat polymorphic calls. So in languages like, like Java, um, the, the type of receiving calls can only be determined at runtime. And sometimes if you have a certain method call, um, there are multiple possible targets, right? And this phenomenon can lead to an explosion of edges. And the upper bound of this range is basically the more conservative approach, while the lower bound is the more realistic approach according to academia. If so little of imported open source code is used, the next immediate question is, of course, how many vulnerabilities can we get rid of because they will never be invoked. And this is what we try to answer in the next two slides. At first, this is an example where a vulnerable method could be reached. So the big and very colorful graph you have seen in the beginning is not overly useful for practical day-to-day -day tasks, right? But all the edges and all the nodes have been annotated so that you can filter and remove stuff in order to drill down into parts that are of a particular interest. In this case, to clarify whether the vulnerability um, you see here is impacting or not the application. In this case, there is indeed an invocation path from the client code, logback access, to a vulnerable method in, a, in one of their dependencies. Uh, here, Jetty HTTP, there was a vulnerability in how Jetty HTTP treated and passed cookie values. And this graph shows immediately to developers that this vulnerability should be cared about, that it matters, because you can see in just three hops that the vulnerable code can be invoked. And so this level of detail is very useful, not only to to let's say, prove and show to developers that it matters, but also when it comes to designing safeguards, maybe um, homemade sanitization methods in case the vulnerable component cannot be updated or there is no update available. Um, and while this was a case where a vulnerable method was reachable, um, in so many other cases, vulnerable methods hidden in the dependencies are not reachable. And that is what we counted and clarified with this following graph. So out of the census two components we looked at, 300 something, the latest 47 components in their latest releases had vulnerable dependencies. And so we wanted to know for those 47 Java components with vulnerable dependencies, how many of those vulnerabilities were actually reachable? How much of the vulnerable code can be reached from the client application? And the very positive results are that only 40% in average, 40% of the vulnerabilities are reachable, which means that 60% of the vulnerabilities can be deprioritized. Uh, de so, they can receive less attention so that the developer effort focuses only on those 40% that really matter in that context. And in 24 out of the 47 cases, there was actually no vulnerability left following um, the reachability analysis. What has to be said though, is that there is a high variability. There is a high standard deviation of 45%, which is due to the fact that vulnerable code is not evenly distributed in the code of your dependencies. Very often you have some components and some functions or classes within such components that are subject to multiple dependencies. Take Jackson data bind, data bind for example. And if you happen to run into this Java class, you're unlucky to run into it, then you end up with a bunch of vulnerabilities. And if you're lucky, you don't run it and you can get rid of a number of vulnerabilities in one shot, basically. So this is explaining why there is a bigger variability 
in, in those results, in those numbers. To be retained, again, this is a I think great news for many software development organizations is that a very significant share, 60% for the components we looked at here of the vulnerabilities can be deprioritized because the code is not reachable. I mean, that's that's a great summary, Henrik, from uh, the presentation that you've done so far. And I mean, if I were to put like my software engineering manager hat on, uh, what does 60% mean to me? Well, you know, imagine a world where I have a thousand vulnerabilities that I need to remediate, and it takes me roughly 10 minutes to remediate each one of those. You know, that's about 166 hours or roughly four person weeks or four engineering weeks worth of uh, work. If I can reduce that by 60%, you know, that's a two and a half week saving uh, for my engineering organization. And I can't, cannot think of an executive, an engineering manager, or even a revenue leader uh, that would not be excited by being able to reduce the, um, the workload on our engineers by 60% so we can have them focus more on forward looking features versus uh, retrospectively, um, you know, remediating these issues that are not even like uh, a risk to the business. So I think that's a lovely way of framing uh, the presentation here. Um, if we go to the next slide, so what I wanted to talk a little bit about just extending on the work that Henrik and the team have done here at Endor is to really talk about, well, you know, where do these learning models actually help us, right? And so there are kind of four key areas that we've tried to focus on as we've tried to think about um, these large learning models as assistance versus um, complete replacements, right? And I use the terminology before autopilot versus copilot. And so if we jump into the next slide, actually, if you take a look here, learning is really valuable, right? So Henrik actually pointed out earlier on in the presentation, these models are very good at summarizing information. And if we can turn down the hallucination or control the temperature of the output, it turns out that it's a very good uh, you know, at time or on demand teacher. And in this example here, what we see is a cross-site scripting vulnerability, and we're able to ask the model, hey, what is a cross-site scripting vulnerability? Can you explain it to me? Where can I go and learn more information? And so it's a great way of steering the developer or the individual into understanding more about what the problem is on demand. Um, the other area, if we jump to the next slide, is around remediation. So given that this tool or this kind of assistant can help us understand what the problem is, we can then coach it with the context of the problem that is relevant to finding the solution. And doing that, we can then actually have the model come back with a solution that is more applicable much faster. And it can be aware of the context that we fed into it as well, rather than allowing it to kind of guesstimate what the right context, context is to come to the conclusion, we can coach it in that direction. And it turns out that when we do that, we start to get much better results. And, and there are even... Um, capabilities like if you've heard of SARIF, which is the, the sa static analysis reference interchange format, it's by uh, Oasis. That's a way of communicating um, static analysis results between different tools. And what's really interesting there is those tools or that standard contains a representation of a source. So some kind of user control input, a sync where some kind of malicious operation or risky operation is taking place. And then a data flow summary showing the path from that source to that sync. Being able to summarize vulnerabilities in that way, we can then actually feed it into the models and ask it, hey, using this information, how do you think I should uh, fix this problem? Or where is the best place to put this fix? And so again, we are working in partnership and not kind of you know blindly saying, hey, please go look at my code. Tell me what's wrong with it and automatically fix it. You know, we're, we're a long way away from that. And then if we progress to the next slide here, you'll see that you know, the other area is prevention. So everything we've spoken about today is around fixing vulnerabilities or issues that have been introduced into the code. But the other area that's super interesting is prevention, right? And this comes back to kind of, if you've ever seen the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise, it's about how can I predictively make sure I don't do the wrong things, all right? I see I'm about to do the wrong thing and the system steps and says, oh, no, no, hang on. You need to do these additional steps to make sure it's safe. Uh, and so, you know, if you look at like the response uh, inhibitors that, that are there inside these models or the filtering technology, you know, 
being able to prevent the model from introducing SQL injections or path injection type vulnerabilities or even hard coded credentials. These are like very common problems today. Um, and having a co-pilot that says, oh, you're doing a SQL injection or you're doing a SQL query here. Uh, let me make sure that you do it in the right way and I'll introduce a sanitizer. Again, is a preventative step, helping the developer in, in build that in the right way. So, and doing it in the context of where they're doing the work, which is, I think, really exciting areas to explore in the future. And then if we jump to the next one, it's about speed. So, you know, a lot of what Henrik has spoken about today is around supply chain problems, right? And so the challenge with supply chain problems is, one morning or one evening, everything is fine. And then the next morning you hear about some kind of critical vulnerability that's affecting some package. And then all of a sudden it's all hands on deck uh, and everyone needs to understand what's going on. And so a big part of, you know, Henrik's kind of summary was like, it's not just that you're using a vulnerable dependency, it's am I exposed? Am I using the vulnerable component or the vulnerable method? And so one of the areas that's really interesting is can I write a query, uh, a semantic query to go and look for areas in my application where I'm calling that vulnerable method? And so here you have an example of like a co-pilot assistant tool actually helping construct a semantic query to go and look for use cases of a particular method. And, and this is actually using the uh, notorious log4j example if any of you kind of suffered through that two years ago. So as you can see here, look kind of these through these four areas, there are ways that LLMs can be brought in to support what we're doing today. And actually, just as a, a little bit of a teaser, I have a video here just maybe to walk through what one of these workflows could look like. So if we have a look here, um, if we just find this up, um, in this example here, I've got a sample Java application that is using log4j, uh, and I've done some analysis on this. And so the first thing is I'll notice that the software composition analysis identified that I'm using a vulnerable version of the log4j library, and I'm using the, a version that will actually allow a nefarious actor to do a remote code execution or, or an RCE, as we more fondly know in the industry. Now, there's a couple of choices here. One is I could bump to the particular version of log4j that removes the issue, but I may not be able to do that because maybe a transitive dependency is bringing it in. So the next question though is, am I using that particular vulnerable method? And here you can see I run a semantic uh, query across my application. And you can see here, it's actually identified a place where I'm using that uh, vulnerable method. So this is actually really important. And if I click the show parts button here, I can even see the flow graph from the user controlled input to the request call and that parameter then flowing all the way into this logger.info call further down in the application. So I really have a problem. I could bump for versions, again, may not always be applicable. So it's interesting to explore how I might actually leverage a co-pilot to help me fix the issue here. And so in here, what I can do is I can bring up the code and I can see here, this is the vulnerable line of code or the call to that vulnerable method. Uh, and so what I wanna do is I wanna understand, well, what's the problem here? So I can actually right click on the issue and I can say, hey, Copilot, can you explain to me what is the problem with this line of code? And you can see here, Copilot is very quick to detect that there's a potential um, injection type problem and it goes through that whole kind of uh, workflow, uh, you know, and, and summarizes that, hey, you should throw this through a sanitizer uh, before you do it. And then I can actually even go a little bit further and say, okay, well, given that you understand the problem, could you propose a solution for me as well? And so here, what you can see is Copilot with some coaching from me has actually come back with a suggested remediation, which is inserting a sanitizer into um, that, that code flow to go and fix the issue. So that's just a very quick example of how these models are able to support us and not replace us. It was still a very, very long way away from, you know, from doing things like that. But you can see here the productivity gain that developers could achieve by presenting with a brand new issue, understanding what is the meaning of this issue, what should I be concerned about, and then getting coaching on how to go fix it as well. And so I think uh, it's you know just really exciting to see the analysis of where is, what are the things that we need to fix the work that Henrik and, and the team at Endor have done and coupling that with the, how do I go fix this as well that these uh, models seem to be able to help us with today. Thank you, Henrik.
Thank you, Nero. That was a nice presentation. Really like that a lot. Nice demo. And um, this basically concludes our presentation. I hope you have uh, liked what you have seen. There will be there are many more details in the research report that I think will be distributed to all the participants of Lean AppSec. If not, if I'm not mistaken, if not, you can download this from our website. And with that, I basically would conclude thanking you again for your attendance. Thank you, Nero, for joining us on this session. That was really, it was really great. Um, Pleasure. And, and yeah, looking forward to the next Lean AppSec conference.